We began last week a, a brief look at a part of the book of Colossians. So if you weren't here last week, I won't say you missed it because you have the DVD, you have the Facebook page, but uh, we are going to continue in Colossians in a moment. But I want to invite everyone, let's take a walk in the Word. Let's open the Word to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Give everybody a chance to find the scripture. As I always say, it must bless the heart of our God to hear the pages of a Bible being opened. Paul writes to the church, teaches us as well this morning. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 19. Please follow if you will. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And let's have everyone turn to Colossians as we pick up where we left off last Sunday, Colossians 2, 6 through 15. Give everyone a chance to find it. I'm going to invite you to share that scripture with me as a unison reading. We'll hear, see, and say God's word together this morning. Colossians 2, as we look at verses 6 through 15. Please join me as we share God's word. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than of Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. If you want to keep your, your hand, your finger, your thumb in that page as we look at these, uh, the first few verses of this passage this morning, please do that as we work through and walk through the word. Let's take a moment and be in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day and we open your word, this extraordinary word that you speak to your people, we pray you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Speak to us where we are. We're all in different places on our faith journeys, all in different places as we are growing spiritually and coming to maturity in Christ. Meet us where we are, Lord, lovingly. Lead us to the place where you'd have us be, Lord, as we open this word. We encounter this word, and it takes root in our hearts, and we pray it will bring fruit. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, last week we focused on perceiving God's purpose for the lives that we're living. And there's a quick summary of the points that Paul talked about in our passage last week. And some of them we stumble over. Some of them are tough to take and do. But here's what Paul said a Christian life should look like. First would be to suffer joyfully for the gospel. 
We talked a little bit about most of us try to run away from suffering, not run to suffering. But when you're suffering for Christ and for the sake of the gospel, it's a different situation. There is a joy if we indeed suffer for the spreading of the gospel. Two, serve according to your calling. We've all been gifted. We all have gifts, callings, and we need to identify our gifting, serve according to your calling, using your gifts for Christ's service. Three, move people to maturity in Christ. All of us who are in Christ have responsibility to others as we help them come to maturity in Christ. You are responsible for one another in the body. Every part of the body is important. You can't whack off a part of the body and say we're still the whole body. And so we must help move people to maturity. Work wholeheartedly with Christ's energy. It's not in your strength. It's in his strength. If it's in my strength, I will surely fail. In his strength, I can't help but succeed. And so work in his energy. We're to enrich the lives of others. Christians should always be that salt in the world. We should be enriching the lives of others, and then delight in obedience, which was one of, it's interesting of these points that we had last week, these six points, the first and the last seem to be the biggest stumbling block for us. We don't like to suffer, and we in this culture have a problem with being obedient. But when it comes to obeying the Lord, that is a Christian's hallmark. We obey Jesus Christ. So those are some of the things we looked at last week. So we live out our purpose, discover that Christian growth is a process. It's not when I come to Christ that, you know, yes, when I come to Christ, I have salvation. But it doesn't mean I've come to full maturity. It's a process that we are all engaged in. And we take a couple steps forward, I take a couple steps back, but we're always moving in the direction of Christ. And so we, we have a purpose. We discover our purpose and our growth. And, and as we receive the Lord and Savior, we are saved in an instant. But we have a lifetime to become mature in Christ as we grow. The growth takes time. Think about that with, with the farmers that are in the congregation. That they don't just plant the, the seed and tomorrow morning harvest the crop. You know, it does take a little time for it to grow. Same thing for Christians who are on their journeys of growth. You know, so our focus shouldn't be just on knowing. As Christians, our focus should also be on knowing and growing. You know, if you have just head knowledge, you know, two people can read this book. One can read it and just say, so what? The other reads it with eyes of faith and says the word of God. They all read the same words, but it's how you approach it. So know, grow. The Bible links information, friends, with transformation. If you have the information, that's only half the journey. You come to transformation. And we're to become what we've begun Truth must be perceived, that's here, it must be personalized here. We have to make the transition from head to heart. And if it's only head knowledge, we aren't on the road. Now, faith that doesn't have an impact on your behavior, what is it? What does James say, faith that doesn't show itself in the works of the people? It's dead, it's dead, James 2.17. You know, that faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by the works, is dead. By the way, which comes first, the faith or the works? Salvation or works? Salvation. Always, we don't work our way into salvation. The works are the evidence of our salvation. That's how Christians take and live our lives. Now, little English lesson. Everyone knows what a mixed metaphor is, don't they? No? Say, I remember that from high school English, a mixed metaphor. What is a mixed metaphor? Was it? A peacekeeping force is a mixed metaphor. Yeah, peacekeeping and force. Jumbo shrimp. Yeah, jumbo shrimp. <laughs> mixed metaphor combines two or more images that really don't belong together. They really don't belong, they contradict each other, they don't belong together, they don't relate, they don't make sense. Now, some mixed metaphors, and you've just heard two, some others that we could think about would be 
you know, you've buttered your bread, now lie in it, right? Or, or clearly you've opened Pandora's box of worms, no? Or burning the midnight oil at both ends. You know, I mean, they, they, they're familiar, but they don't sound right. They aren't right, you know, marching to the beat of a dead horse. No, okay. Or it's time to step up to the plate and cut the mustard. No, I mean, these are mixed metaphors. They don't belong together, don't make sense. Uh, robbing Peter to pay the piper. The piper, Terry, yeah. That's a mixed metaphor, robbing P Peter to pay the piper. You know, so these are mixed metaphors. You just read a raft load of mixed metaphors in Colossians. Paul gave you metaphors in the beginning of our passage. Look at Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Several metaphors in order to describe the process of spiritual growth. And so this is, look for what are metaphors in this passage. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. There are some metaphors for the Christian life in those two verses. And so we're going to pull them out and look at them a little bit this morning and how they apply to our lives. You know, on the faith side, the Colossians had received Christ Jesus as Lord, right? He says, you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. But on the practice side, he says, now you've received him, you've got to do something about it, do something with it. So on the practice side, they need to continue to live in him, be built up in him, be strengthened in their faith, overflowing with thankfulness. He uses five word pictures here that deal with spiritual progress, and let's see how they apply to our lives this morning. Because remember, we open the word, the word speaks to God's people in every generation. First, we are to be spiritual, and I'm using the term when we look at it, power walkers. You know, we're, anybody do power walking? Anybody do less than powerful walking? <laughs> I do. That's, that's me. Christian life must be lived out from head to heart to hands to feet. Paul says, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, you must continue to live in him. That's the power walking. Reminding readers that since they received Jesus by faith, they must walk by faith in his power. So that's the only way to make spiritual progress. And the verb here in the Greek is in continuous action. It means you and I, Christians, we are to continuously walk in him. This isn't something I do today and forget tomorrow. This is a continuous process. We are to live in Christ. In the past event of receiving Christ, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you accepted him as Lord, that past event should inform your present conduct, right? Say, oh yeah, I received Jesus. I know the day I received Jesus back in 1976. I can tell you the place, the time when I went forward and accepted the Lord. I know all about that. But if that in 76 doesn't inform today in Menden for me, then it was not a true conversion. I don't know what it was, maybe a game I'm playing with God or myself, but it wasn't the real deal. So it must inform your life today. So we continue to live in Christ every day, every hour. That's how Christians are to walk. You know, and so our conduct must be consistent with Christ's lordship. To say Christ is your Lord and your conduct contradicts that, and you claim to be a Christian, there's a problem. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a disconnect there, isn't it? that you claim his lordship and it doesn't inform your conduct. And so our conduct must conform with his lordship. It must conform to our principles as Christians, our walk. So the Colossians hadn't merely received the teachings of Christ. Paul says they received Jesus himself. When you come to Christ, and this is a sincere surrender to him, you receive Jesus Christ, not just as teaching. Anyone can open the book and read teaching. You received Christ. The spirit of the living God is in you today. I think it's interesting, the title he uses here, Jesus Christ as Lord. That's unique. 
That is the only time Paul uses that formula, Jesus Christ as Lord, in all of his writing. We're looking at something that's pretty special here, pretty singular in the scripture this morning, that he only uses it here. Um, As Christ, Jesus is identified with Messiah. Messiah meaning what? The anointed one. The anointed one. He is the anointed one. He's the one promised to Adam and Abraham, to Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He is the anointed one promised. And he's the one prophesied. Prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah. So Christ, Messiah, the anointed one. And then, then we have you know, that he is his Hebrew name, his birth name. Jesus. Well, Jesus isn't his Greek name, is it? How many think it's his Greek name? It is. It is his Greek name. What's his Hebrew name? Yeshua. Yeshua. Joshua. Our Lord's name is Joshua. Yeshua. And what does Yeshua mean in Hebrew? God saves. God saves. God saves. So he is the anointed one whose name says God saves, right? And and then Lord. To call him Lord indicates what? That, That he is sovereign. He is supreme. We submit, we surrender to his lordship. And I always say we have, again, another disconnect. Because we call him Savior, we call him Lord, right? He's Savior and Lord. There's a difference You come to the cross, embrace him at the cross, and say, Savior, he saved me at the cross. But you call him Lord when you walk away from the cross into the world and you live under his lordship. And a lot of people are really happy to come to the cross and say, Savior, but have a real tough time walking into life and calling him Lord. We sort of forget him once we walk away from the cross saying, Savior. Lord is a different thing. He saved me. He saved me, that's great. But you mean every day I have to do this Christian lordship thing? That's a tough thing. That's a tough thing. And so he's Lord. So he is Messiah. He's Christ Jesus as Lord. And the people of Colossae had received him. Friends, Jesus Christ the Lord has no rivals. There are none who can rival him. This is an extraordinary identification Paul presents. And so we are power walkers who continue to live in him. Second metaphor that I want to share with you, he's really using the metaphor of a tree. He's using a metaphor of a tree. Now what do I mean? It's an agricultural metaphor. He says you're rooted. You are rooted. That's a metaphor. We're a tree or like a bush. We are rooted in the ground. We are to be grounded in the soil of God's word. That's the soil where we get our nourishment and we grow, where we grow. So as the tree is rooted in the ground, we are rooted in the word. And that's the place where we grow. And a tree that's rooted, a tree that's rooted gets not only nourishment from the soil, but it gets strength to withstand the storms that come, right? Well, so do we. When you are rooted in the word of God, you get the strength to withstand the storms that come. And we see trees stand through extraordinary storms. Well, so do Christians stand through extraordinary storms. And so he uses, he refers to us as trees. We're rooted. And the tense of the Greek means once and for all you have been rooted. Once and for all. If you are rooted in Jesus Christ, you're not going to be transplanted somewhere else. That's where you're rooted and that's where you'll grow. And that's where we have to grow. Deep down, nutrition, stability. We go deep with Christ. We're nourished in Christ. We withstand the storms in Christ. And this image comes from, and if you know the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, or 17, excuse me, verse 8. And this will sound familiar to lots of us. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear. It is what? The tree. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. 
You know, so this is an image well known to the Hebrews coming from the prophet Jeremiah. And so Paul pulls it forth that we're rooted in relationship with Christ. And in relationship with Christ, rooted there, you have all you need. You have all you need. You know, I've never seen plants in a garden or in a field pick up themselves and go looking for a greener pasture. You know, where you're planted, you grow, and Christians have what we need when we're planted in the Word. And then 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, Just as a tree can't thrive without roots, we can't grow if we haven't been grounded in what Peter said is Jesus' glory and goodness. You're grounded in Jesus' glory, his goodness. Now, the next metaphor I'd suggest in these two verses is one of a building. One of, you, of a building. I know there have been times in my wife, life I've felt like a barn, okay, this way. But we're all identified as a building. Paul uses construction imagery to show that as our foundation is built on Christ, we continue to build upon the foundation. There's a building going on here. He says we're being built up in him. And so Ephesians 2.20, we just read, tells us that when we accepted Christ, we built on the foundation of the uh, apostles and the prophets. You know, and with Christ Jesus, we're told by Paul in Ephesians, he is the chief cornerstone. He is the head. And what is a cornerstone? What is a cornerstone? It's at the foundation, and a cornerstone is located where two walls meet, right? Where two walls meet. And if the cornerstone is there, at least now in the time of the, of the scriptures, a lot of the buildings were built out of stone. They're built out of stone, out of rock. And they're trying to take and align the walls with each other. And the cornerstone fitted into it, gave alignment to the walls. It gave security. You know, security it made sturdy the walls so that they would hold firmly, but they would be properly aligned. You know, one of the worst things you can ever see is when you're building and you see the wall is bulging out somewhere, or those who have had the misfortune of a flooding basement and see walls bulging in. And, but, but the cornerstone gives alignment and gives stability. And we all know that, and so, so Paul is referring to us as a building, and we're being built up. He tells us that Christ is the chief cornerstone, and as the cornerstone, Jesus holds it all together for us. And I love the alignment, because when we're in Christ, we have alignment for our lives. Our lives are aligned, just like the cornerstone gives alignment to the wall. And he provides security and stability now, a foundation, a foundation. We know the parable Jesus talked about, the guys who build on the sand and on the rock. The rock is foundation. This building we're sitting in wouldn't be of much use to us now if it hadn't been built on a foundation, right? I mean, what if we had just built the walls and the roof without a foundation? So the foundation is essential, but... What if we just put in the foundation and never, never build anything following it? We say, well, that's Menden Church there. Use your imagination. You know, so, so the foundation is essential. But if you don't build on it, you are wasting the foundation God has prepared for you. The foundation has been laid in the apostles and the prophets. The cornerstone, the chief, the head is Christ. He gives us alignment for life. He gives us stability as we build our lives. So these, again, are all metaphors that, that he's putting into these couple of verses. It's quite a, quite a collection he gives us. So the base is laid in order to build a strong, usable building. So that's also a message. The foundation's laid. That's your conversion. That's when you come to Christ. That's the conversion. But you move from conversion to construction if you're a Christian. If there's no construction following conversion, the foundation sits unused. So the foundation's laid for every one of us in this room, friends. Every one of us has a foundation laid. Now 
go to construction. What are we doing with the life, the foundation? How are we building it? So the tense in the Greek here indicates that the building of Christian lives is an ongoing process. Building your life into the image of Jesus Christ doesn't stop. Every Christian's under construction. I love that, that phrase the Gaithers years ago put out a children's album called Kids Under Construction. I love that album because we're all kids under construction. We're all in process of being built, of growing. And so build on the foundation. Every Christian continues building every day. The Christian life, and, and by the way, what are you building on the foundation? What kind of building are you putting on the foundation? Some ranchackle thing with secondhand material? What are you putting there? It's the quality of what you're building in Christ. You know, and I don't think you're building a three-room bedroom ranch house or a Cape Cod, and you're probably not building a two-story colonial. If you are building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, building your life, it's a skyscraper. It's a skyscraper, and it literally will scra scrape heaven for you when you build that life in Christ. And so the foundation will hold what you build in Christ. It will always hold firm for you. Now, the fourth metaphor I see Paul using here is that of a student. I know he doesn't use the word, but look at the scripture again, the phrase, you're strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Strengthened in the faith that you were taught. If you were taught, friends, you were a student. And so that's an image he uses for Christians. You know, we're to be students in God's graduate school so that our faith will be strengthened. So are you teachable Christians? Our Christians should be teachable. We should have teachable spirits so that we can be taught, you know, and taught the word of God to grow in our faith. And so as a disciple, we like to use the word disciple for the folks who follow Jesus, right? We're the disciples today, and the disciple literally is a student who sits at the feet of a teacher. That's what a disciple means. You sit at the feet of a teacher, you're a student. So all Christians are students of our teacher, our rabbi, Jesus. So I want to challenge you. Make sure you're putting yourself in a place, in an environment where you can be taught. You know, whether it's a men's fellowship or it's one of the Bible studies or a home group, whatever it is, that you are finding yourself in a place where you can be taught, where you can grow in the word of God. You'll be strengthened on a regular basis. You know, and, and Sunday morning is a good place to be because, you know, Hebrews says we shouldn't forsake assembling ourselves together. You know, the writer of Hebrews says if you don't go to church, you're a pagan, which is an interesting image for people. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the church. No, I don't go. I go once in a while, punch the clock, do the time, you know. But no, we are students, and we should look for every opportunity we can to grow in God's word. And yeah, Paul specifically says, as you were taught, you know, that you get strength from the teaching. So I want to ask you this question. You're a Christian, right? How can you stand on the word of God if you don't know what it is? How can you stand on the word of God if you don't know what it is? You know, it's, as I've said many times in this pulpit, that if we in America... If everyone picked up the Bibles in their bedrooms, their family rooms, off of a coffee table, off a shelf, if we all did it all at once, it would be the biggest dust storm America's ever seen. So how can you know the word? You have to get in the word. Then you can stand on it. And so Paul's calling us be students. You know, and this is a graduate course of education for Christians. You've, been, you've had conversion, now you go to another level of growth. And you know what? When is graduation day from being a student under the teaching of Rabbi Jesus? Now, your graduation day is your homegoing day. When you actually go to meet the Lord face to face, that's your graduation day, and you're a student up until then. Now, the fifth metaphor I'm going to pull out of this is a river. And again, yes, he doesn't use the word river. But let's look at this. There's a word picture here of a river that's bursting its banks. And it's the phrase, overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with thankfulness. The word used overflowing does mean a river that is bursting its banks. And so it's a beautiful image. As we receive instruction in biblical truth, 
it should produce joy. And the more we understand grace, the more gratitude we should have. I believe this, a thankless spirit betrays a, betrays a life that is no longer focused on the greatness of Christ. If your spirit is without thanks giving, you've lost focus of Jesus Christ. How can you possibly have your eyes set on Jesus and not be thankful? It's not possible. And so if you have a thankless spirit, somehow you're not looking at the Lord any longer. It's like Peter walking on water, taking his eyes off the Lord for a moment and entertaining the storm rather than looking at the Lord and sinking. And it happens to us too. You know, friends, your fears see your problems, but your faith sees your Lord. Your Lord is bigger than any problem. Jesus will trump them all. Looking at Paul's use of metaphors, verses 6 and 7, they challenge us to do four things. Now, these are all in your study guide in the bulletin, so you, know, you can look at them and take them home with you. They challenge us to do four, four things. First, looking at these metaphors, we are to grow downward by being rooted. Second, we're to grow upward by being built up. Third, we're to grow inward by being strengthened in the faith. And fourth, we're to grow outward by overflowing with thankfulness. Those are the four things that come out of these metaphors in those verses. And a challenge to every one of us in the room, yours truly included, that we need to look at those truths, say, how are they being lived in our lives today? Paul mixes up his metaphors. He changes verb tenses on us, you know, you know, to show us what's happening to us and in us as Christians and what we're responsible for. In this list of five word pictures, there are only two active verbs used. Two active verbs, and here they are. Live in him, be thankful to him. Those are the things. Live in him, be thankful are the two action verbs out of those five. So you start living in him, and when you live in him, you come to be thankful to him. It makes a lot of sense. In other words, our living should lead to thanksgiving. Verse 8 says we should be on guard. Be on guard. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Something that depends totally on something of this world created by man rather than depending upon Christ. This teaching of Paul's is important. Please, with verse 8, we need to understand it. In response to conditions that may occur in foreign countries, our State Department will issue warnings to Americans traveling abroad, right? Sometimes they'll simply say, you know, do not go to these countries. Do not go there. Many times, most of the time, they say, we give you a warning that while you're there, be on guard. Be on guard. Wander around certain parts of Mexico, you're going to be kidnapped. You know, so they're be on guard. Be on guard. Paul is playing State Department for Christians this morning. Be on guard. Be on guard, but, but what, what's, what's going to happen to us? It's a problem, be on guard. You know, false teachers, he said. False teachers have infiltrated. They're in the community, and sometimes they come into the church. They come into the Christian community, and they use seductive tactics, taking God's people away from the truth. So Paul issues a warning. You know, you're traveling with a, a passport, heaven's passport. You, you are a member of the kingdom of God. Right? He says, be careful, be on your guard. Don't be captured by teachings that are contrary to Christ. Now, he says philosophy. What does philosophy mean? Phila, love. It means love of wisdom. Love of, that's all the word means. Philosophy means love of wisdom. Wow. Who's got something against wisdom? Why shouldn't we love wisdom? That's where the deception comes in. You know, Paul says that philosophy that's contrary to Christ is hollow. It's empty. It's empty. 
know, that's why when people go to, to counseling, we hope they want to see them going to a Christian counselor, someone who brings Christ in the room. You know, that if it's some, a philosophy that's contrary to Christ and his teaching, it is empty, it is hollow, and there are many of them running around today. They have no substance. Second characteristic uh, that this philosophy is deceptive. It's deceptive. It sounds good. Friends, it's intentionally designed to look good, but it leads people away from biblical truth. You know, and many Christians fall away from the faith when they're entangled by man-made deceptions. You know, I... You know, I struggle so hard with our, with our neighbors and friends in Mormonism. You know, but it's, it's a man-made thing that is contrary to Scripture. And so we love them, but, but, but be on guard. Don't fall victim. Don't fall captive. Don't be kidnapped by philosophies that are contrary to God's word. You know, and... and Third reason that we're to be on guard is that these deceptive and hollow philosophies, Paul says, depend on human tradition. They come from man. They don't come from God. They're not God-inspired. They don't have the spirit in them. They're man's tradition. They arise out of man's thinking. And when they find a foothold in society and they're passed along generation to generation, it appears to be popular and people don't challenge them. People don't dare raise a challenging word. Why, everyone's accepted that. We all believe that. Hardly everyone, there's anyone cares to challenge them because we say everyone believes it. Well, no. And so it's hollow, it's deceptive. It comes from man's thinking, not God's thinking. And then fourth, this philosophy depends on the basic principles of the, this world. The phrase actually means, and this is really a cute phrase, that basic principles of the world, it's a phrase that literally means in the Greek, things that are in a row. Things that are in a row. This is, and it, it actually means the elementary things, basic things. It came to be identified, this, this Greek, meaning the alphabet. So have any of you grown beyond your ABCs? You fall away. You're taken captive by deceptive, hollow philosophy that is not of Christ and the Word. You're going back to being a child learning ABCs. You have fallen so far back, you are falling into something that is elementary and has no future. It is the beginning stage of idolatry. It's a beginning stage of idolatry is what Paul's talking about. He says, warning, Christians, be on guard. No man-made religion can lead to truth, for truth is found where? How did Jesus self-identify? I am the way, the Jesus is the truth. You want to know truth? Jesus is the truth. Look at his word. Live in his life. Jesus is the truth. You know, something hollow, empty, devoid of truth. Can't fill anyone. It'll just make you more empty. And it happens to people who are pulled away from Christianity by the hollowness. Contrast, Colossians 1.25 says that when we've received the word of God, we got it in its fullness, all of it. It's all ours. In its fullness, Colossians 2.2 2, reminds us that because we know Christ, we have the full riches of complete understanding. So if we put verses 6, 7, and 8 together this morning, we can conclude this way that a grounded, growing, grateful believer won't be led astray, and you don't have to worry about being spiritually kidnapped. If you're a power walker in Christ, a tree that's rooted, a building that's, up, that's firm on foundation, a student who's learning, and you're an overflowing river with joy and thanksgiving in God. Now, that's what Paul said in those few verses. I made it shorter. Well, I mean, my little summary was shorter, not the sermon. Okay. <laughs> but I want to close with a single question this morning. As you look at these three verses, there's the question on the screen. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to get a conviction? Now, we've, we, have been, we have been, you know, saturated with court cases for years, News channels thrive on it. Talk shows thrive on it. 
Was there enough evidence to convict? No, there's not all this kind of thing. So I put the question to you this morning that Paul is really asking in that passage. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to get a conviction? And only you can answer that question for yourself. No one else can. Oh, there is one other who knows the answer. Would you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the opportunity, the blessing you give us to gather together as your people in this place freely to worship you as we are led in the Spirit. Not living in fear, but in freedom, freedom in Christ, and that we are in a land where we have freedom to pray and to worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us this morning, for opening your word for us, that we as students might together learn, for we are all on this journey of growth. We pray, Lord, we pray that the time we've shared together in your word will indeed bear much fruit for our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, Messiah Yeshua, the one we love, the one we adore, the one we surrender our lives to, the one we seek to serve, for he gave his all for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.